Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for today's Network Mind Out webinar uh, with Dr. Stephen Kerry uh, talking about transgender people in the Northern Territory. Uh, before we start today's webinar, we'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we're gathering today. And with being an online webinar, we have people from all over Australia. So I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians from all the places in which we're, we're coming from today. Um, uh, and just a few uh, things around today's webinar. Um, I'll be just introducing uh, Dr. Stephen Kerry and then I'll be logging off. My name is Sally. I'm the National Mind Out Project Coordinator with the National LGBTI Health Alliance. Uh, today, when Stephen uh, is doing their presentation, you're able to ask questions and provide comments and you can do that with the, the chat box which is on the lower left hand side of the screen. Um, so just throughout today's presentation you can type questions and answers there, um, though Stephen will likely uh, answer those at the end of the presentation today. Um, but if you have a thought that pops up just please jot it down there. Uh, and if you have any technical difficulties, um, please also just type a message in that box there just to let us know if you're having trouble with sound or video um, or anything along those lines. Um, okay, so I'm going to introduce um, Stephen. Um, so Dr. Stephen Carey is a lecturer in sociology at the Charles Darwin University and has been involved in queer activism for the last 27 years. Um, over the last 17 years, they've dedicated their academic career to the pursuit of knowledge pertaining to the health and well-being of intersex and transgender Australians, as well as anyone who lives on the gender margins in society. Um, Stephen lives in Darwin with their two feline fur babies, uh, one of who actually chewed through the wires of their headset the other day that we needed for today. So I was, it was a last minute emergency to get new headsets. Um, and today, um, Stephen's going to be talking about um, transgender people in the Northern Territory. Um, so I'm going to let um, hand over to Stephen and let them describe their work that they're doing. And hopefully you'll find this to be a really informative and useful presentation. Um, I know I've really enjoyed meeting Stephen previously and talking about this. So I'll hand over to Stephen. Thanks, Sally. It's really great to, to be here. And um, it's really great to have this opportunity to share some of my research. Um, I also want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I stand, the Larrakea people in the Darwin area. I also want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I do want to let you know that my presentation today does refer to Indigenous Australians, um, both living and deceased, and does include some images of Indigenous people, um, hopefully um, taken from um, some other sources. So hopefully there is respect there in my use of them. Just get my started. So I guess I want to start my presentation by talking a little bit about who I am. Um, and thanks to Sally for giving a little bit of an introduction to some of my background. So my name is Dr. Stephen Kerry, and I want to um, you know, sort of preempt some of the things I'm going to discuss by talking about myself. Um, so I was born in Newcastle in New South Wales. It's a place that I consider home. I am a second generation Australian born to English migrants. And while I'm not cisgendered, um, I'm not transgender. I do identify, however, as genderqueer. I live with a mental illness. I am a Buddhist and I'm a fan of science fiction. Always happy to have a chat about science fiction. I currently live in Darwin with my two cat companions and as Sally indicated we had a bit of an emergency yesterday when one of my cats does love to chew through cords. Bless them. I outline these things about myself because they inform my research. My research employs a framework which is heavily influenced by feminism, postmodernism, queer theory and of course transgender theory. Underlining this is a focus on voices and understanding that the researcher and their subjectivity is a significant factor in that project. Thus, I come to research about trans people in the Northern Territory as an outsider. I'm an outsider because I only moved to Darwin in 2012. I'm an outsider because I'm not traditionally trans and I'm an outsider because I'm not Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. I knew that when I started my project that there may be, these may be barriers to conducting research. 
More broadly, Territorians are actually reluctant to invest too much time or energy in new people. There's actually quite a lot of animosity toward people from so-called down south. Thus, in order to gauge the level of interest and also to maybe prove myself to the community, I began an online survey in 2014. Researchers suggested that online surveys are quite important in any research which focuses on transgender populations. And one reason for this is that it allows an opportunity to recruit participants over large geographical areas. Thus, considering that the Northern Territory is twice the size of France, an online survey appeared irrelevant. While I'm cautious that the digital divide, which often suggests that Indigenous people do not access or use online technologies, Research suggests that the opposite is actually true. In a report called The Measuring Australia's Digital Divide, the authors concluded that the Northern Territory currently ranks fourth out of eight states and territories for digital inclusion. And they go on to suggest that Indigenous Australians in remote areas of the Northern Territory are quickly adopting new technologies and engaging in behaviours not necessarily found in other populations. Notably, they are engaging practices such as sharing of devices. Research done by Bronwyn Carlson and her colleagues argue that social media and Facebook in particular are, by, are, by, sorry, are being used by Aboriginal people in help seeking and help giving, especially around issues of death, mourning and suicide. My own research has revealed that Indigenous communities do share information via new technology sharing devices. Star Lady, who you'll be introduced to in this research, is a founding member of the organisation Sisters and Brothers NT. And they found that resources they were distributing on USB devices were being passed around not only within communities, but also across communities. Such that when she and other members of the organisation arrived in a new community, his members had already seen those resources. At the end of the online survey, uh, 13 people had participated. They were a diverse group. Their, their gender identities included trans man, man, trans woman, sister girl, gender queer, transgendered, F2M and crossdresser. Their sexual orientations included bisexual, straight, queer, lesbian and gay. Although the majority of participants were white or Caucasian, two were reported, did report themselves to be mixed race. Others were of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, and one person self-identified as Asian. Two people were living outside the NT at the time, and those who were inside the Northern Territory were located either in Darwin or Alice Springs, or in some of the remote areas of the Northern Territory. This diversity and the fact that participants were drawn from across the Northern Territory suggests that there was perhaps a success in attracting people from across the Northern Territory and a diverse group itself. I also received a great deal of um, positive feedback from the community, from members and organisations about this research, the research being both timely and necessary. Because of this success and the feedback I got, I decided to extend the project to in-depth interviews. Between May 2015 and February this year, I interviewed a further 13 people and their gender identity, sexual orientation and ethnicity were not as, well, sorry, were not quite different from um, those of the online survey. In total, 26 people participated and this far exceeded my expectations of the success of the project. And it's their views, their lived experiences that I'm going to share with you today. Having said that, in terms of the success, there is a critical limitation to my research. Of these 26 people, only four identify themselves as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. This is something I claim full responsibility for. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to travel across the Northern Territory, nor specifically to the Tiria Islands. However, however, I hope that the two sister girls I interviewed, Crystal and Brianna, are key, who are key advocates in the sister girl community, and who have spoken out for many years, help um, speak to some of their issues and highlight some of the broader issues facing this community. So I hope that they are, signif um, uh, they are significant representations of the community and 
what they face. To also address this issue, I also decided to conduct an analysis <clears throat> of first-person narratives. While sister girls and brother boys have been largely ignored by the Australian transgender literature, they have attracted the attention of anthology editors, reporters, documentary makers, and television hosts. Sister Girls and Brother Boys have also been publishing their own stories on YouTube. I added this additional research tool because these narratives go a long way to reflect the oral tradition, which is a prominent feature of Indigenous cultures. In addition to the three sister girls and one brother boy who participated in my research, an additional 18 people were also part of this analysis. This included 18 sister girls and seven brother boys five of whom were from the Northern Territory and the remaining were from the New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia, Victoria and Western Australia. The Australian transgender literature is quite extensive, extending back to the 1970s. However, they rarely do include Indigenous people. So, sorry, so it seemed important that I do as much as I could to incorporate their unique issues. All the more important because the Northern Territory has 28% of its population who are Indigenous, which is far more than the Australian average of 2%. And there also remains a significant portion of the culture who live in traditional or remote communities. In particular, the Tiwi Islands has a well-established sister girl community of between 40 to 60 members. Yet no one seems to know why. When Crystal was on the SBS's Insight program and asked why there were so many sister girls on the Tiwi Islands. She responded by saying, there must be something in the water. So these sort of emphasis, emphasis on large indigenous cultures seem to be important to include in my research. And I will return mostly to issues facing sister girls and brother boys uniquely later on today. But first I want to highlight those issues which impact upon most trans territorians. I just mentioned that Australia transgender literature goes back to the 1970s and similar to Sister Girls and Brother Boys, rarely are trans people from the Northern Territory included in this research. Thus, we know very little about the issues facing, facing trans territorians. And this is one of the primary motivations for me to do this research. There is more to be revealed in my research than just the lives of trans territorians. I argue that the issues they face may in fact be very familiar to other trans people living in remote areas of Australia. In preparation of this project, I completed a literature review of a dozen research projects and conference reports. I determined that quite broadly, trans Australians experience economic instability, social exclusion, illness and abuse. Now that my research into trans territories is complete, I can conclude that there is not much dissimilar to these broader issues. Trans territories do ex also experience these problems. However, however, what is significant is location. The geographic and demographic features of the Northern, Northern Territory aggravate these issues. While all trans Australians may have these difficulties, those who live in remote areas of Australia often find them to be more so. Today I'm going to discuss two of the more pressing issues, social isolation and difficulties accessing healthcare. Many trans territorians did speak of support from family and friends, some of whom were quite surprised by this and argued that times are changing. Notably, it's much easier to come out as trans now than a decade or more ago. However, they still experience social isolation because they do not know another trans person to talk to. Research has noted that transgender people seek support from similar peers to normalise and validate emotional experiences related to discrimination. So it's quite important that peer support, in addition to family, in addition to friends, is an important part of a transgender person's experience. 
For the rest of this, um, my presentation, I will be quoting a lot from my participants. And what I've um, attempted to do here is provide you with little snippets of what they've said. So you can read along to some of the quotes that I'll read out. I've also added their name and their primary gender identity and their age to give you a sense of who these people are. Some of these people have agreed to use their real names in the research and others have um, had a pseudonym assigned. So Belinda struggled on her journey alone. She says, you end up having to work on yourself and end up finding specialists on your own. It doesn't help when you're struggling mentally as well. When asked specifically about her needs, Hamilton stated to be around others like me, queer, weird. I feel like a fish out of water around straits. Sian was of the view that you don't see a lot of transgenders around. This was because there's nothing here that the ones that do stay are usually the ones who are born here and have connection. More specifically, especially when it comes to the idea of peer support, Sian also thought that those who come to the territory are married or living a straight life. Some of the trans men in Darwin did have informal social networks. Felix described it as a small private group of trans friends that catch up to offer support. And Ivan said, I have a lot of F2M friends in the Northern Territory, and we're all doing well here. Others have to travel the long, long distances to other capital cities to socialise with other trans people. Patricia relies on seven or eight friends who made up in a southern capital city. She says, I only see them every six months. We discuss on Facebook. When they do get together, they just talk about our experiences, how things are going and the way we are living. Similarly, Leah also goes to a southern capital city to socialise. We went out to a nightclub, went to the city. We had a wine at a dining district, met some friends as Leah. A friend of Amelia's recently came out as trans to her, but she still lives with her parents in the same remote part of the Northern Territory. Amelia says, I can't actually be there to help her out. If I lived where she is living, I could, sort of, I could say, come to my place. The Australian transgender literature reveals that many trans Australians are single, and some of my participants were. Therefore, it was not surprising that another feature of social isolation is the difficulties with dating. At the time of the author's interview with Star Lady, she was thinking of leaving the Northern Territory because it's fucking impossible to get a date in Alice Springs because of the stigma around dating trans people. She went on to elaborate there is a stigma attached to straight cis men who openly date trans women. She says, people are shaming them for being attracted to trans people. Not only are we being shamed, but the people who are attracted to us are shamed. Julia agreed. A lot of guys are okay with you if you're discreet. Not many would openly date trans women. They'd happily sleep with them. Rihanna was also of the view it can be very hard for a trans woman to even date, to find somebody to love, finding a partner who identifies as a cisgender straight male who doesn't care. She goes on to say that a lot of men who don't, Sorry, a lot of men don't want to be seen with trans women in public or people knowing about it. They keep it hidden. I think they're afraid of being judged. This is a very negative impact on trans women and how they see themselves. Star Lady is fed up with this duplicity. She says, this affects our personal lives and that affects how we can find love in this world. I think it's a really essential thing for your well-being. And so I found my well-being was impacted upon even though I'm very accepted and loved in Alice Springs. It's like my well-being is affected because I can't find love and intimacy. And that is an essential part of being human. And I deserve that. I want that. Like Star Lady, Julia says, it doesn't make you feel very good when you only desired loved in public. It's not, sorry, loved in private. It's not good for our self-esteem. It could be argued that this is because the Northern Territory is very masculine and blokey. In Dino Hodge's ethnography of gay and homosexual men in Darwin, he observed that the city boasts a tradition of being a frontier town, and he goes on to say it is very rough and male-dominated. Sian agrees, saying there is an ochre feel and there is a workman culture. 
In Flood and Hamilton's research, they have suggested that the Northern Territory is one of the two most homophobic states and territories in Australia. And this view is supported by Nell. She says she has never lived in such a repressed state in my whole life as I have in the Northern Territory. Julia relayed several stories to me about straight cis men's negative reactions to trans women. In one such conversation, a friend first prefaced his, commented, his comment by saying, I've got nothing against transgender people or gender diversity. Yet he then proceeded to say to Julia, but if I got with a girl and found out she was trans, I would probably beat her or fucking kill her. Understandably, Julia was horrified by this disclosure. She went on to share a second experience with me with a straight cis man. She says, he brought me a drink and we were dancing. I ended up going home with him. I just assumed he knew. I know that was bad of me because I thought it was obvious, but then in the morning he was surprised and I don't really know where that came from. He was fine and he stayed for a few hours and then he said he didn't know that and that in the future you should tell guys because I'm okay with it, but I'm not sure a lot of straight guys would be. Verbal harassment, physical assault and rape are prominent issues for trans Australians. In the first Australian National Trans Mental Health Study in 2014, half of the participants had experienced discrimination or harassment in the 12 months prior to the survey. I want to just emphasize that, half, just within the 12 months prior to the survey. This isn't 12 months, sorry, this isn't half over their entire lives. This is just in the 12 months prior to the survey. And these stories are very much prevalent in some of the stories the trans people were telling me. While social isolation is one key issue, another key issue for trans territorians is the difficulty in accessing health care. Kelvin said one of the reasons he hasn't started medically assisted transition is because of the lack of resources in Darwin. Catherine noted there are hardly any doctors who deal with sister girls issues. This partly includes access to hormone and sex reassignment surgery. And as a result, it has become a push factor for many people to leave or to at least consider leaving the Northern Territory. Of my participants, almost all spoke of leaving. And since speaking with me, many have left the Northern Territory. Julia says, I feel like there's not enough resources here and I'd be better off going to a Southern capital city for that. Sienna agrees, yeah, a lot of them do eventually leave because of the medical reasons. There's nothing here. When trans territorians did speak of difficulties accessing healthcare, it was also in regards to general health care and not just pertaining to sex reassignment surgery or gender reassignment. When trans territorians do access healthcare, they may have one of two types of encounters. First, they may encounter medical professionals who have not heard of trans. Mary was of the view that most doctors in the Northern Territory had not even heard of the transgendered, let alone knew how to treat them. In an incident in hospital, Patricia described how they sort of looked at me and they just didn't know what to do. They just don't know how to approach me. They just didn't know what to do. Thus, many felt that they must educate their doctors before they can access health care. Star Lady said, you have to go advocate for yourself every time and you have to educate. And as a client, that's not right. The second type of encounter trans territorians experience is transphobia. Kelvin was of the view that what is needed is finding gender-friendly medical help. Hamilton similarly had experienced some doctors who also have been transphobic or asked inappropriate questions. She went on to say, I saw a doctor about a toothache and was asked whether I had phalloplasty surgery. The relevance escaped me. When Leah first approached a doctor about being transgender, this is over a decade ago, she spilled my guts with him. However, he responded by saying, why would you want a big hairy guy on you? Difficulties accessing healthcare are aggravated by the fact that Darwin and Alice Springs hospitals are training hospitals 
and medical staff are transitory. During the incident mentioned above, Patricia went on to say that they had to get the main doctor who they were training under and get him to come and see me and explain to him what was happening. Sian agrees, saying that Doc Darwin is a training city for doctors. It's continuously rolling over and new ones coming in all the time. Thus, especially when it comes to counsellors and psychiatrists, she said, you put all your emotions into a counsellor and within three to six months, they're putting their resignation in. They're going on to the next level. As a result, according to Sian, you've got to go through the whole life story again. And for some who is going through that, it's her just horrific. Always going back, restarting. Belinda viewed the hospital in Alice Springs in a similar way. She says, there is something else there's nothing, so there is something else here in our springs. They, they've made this hospital here a training hospital, and it really shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a continuous training facility. Not unlike the mining industry, the medical profession in the Northern Territory relies on fly-in, fly-out workers. Brianna stressed that it would be good if health professionals are here long-term and get some training in diagnosing a transgender person. If this was the case, then sister girls and brother boys wouldn't have to leave thousands of kilometres down south to get it. A lot of them wouldn't have to leave their communities. And I'll, again, I'll come back to discussing sister girls and brother boys uniquely in, in a few minutes. Difficulties accessing healthcare is quite significant because trans Australians have some of the highest rates of mental illness. Their rates of mental illness are actually higher than gay men and lesbians. Over half of my participants were at least likely to be experiencing mental illness at the time of their participation. I went on to compare my, the participants' self-rating of their mental health and their responses to a mental health test I implemented. And there were some discrepancies. Thus, it is likely that some of the trans territorians are experiencing unreported or at least unacknowledged mental illness. At the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned that I too have a mental illness and I wanted to share with you just my experience. Last year, when I was in the middle of having an episode, I tried to find a psychiatrist here in the Northern Territory. The ones I did find that were available would cost me $800 just for a first visit. I'd also try to find interstate doctors who would um, consult with me over Skype. But I had to do that not in terms of those who are eligible for Skype consultations, but ones who are queer friendly and ones that were specialised in my specific issue. I gave up after two months. So if I gave up after two months, it's silly, clearly going to be an issue for people who are struggling just to come out and articulate their experiences. Many issues that affect trans territorians, a lot of the issues I've just raised, also impact upon sister girls and brother boys specifically. However, Australia's transgender first peoples also experience other issues unique to being transgender and being Aboriginal. This includes racism within the trans community and transphobia within the traditional Aboriginal communities. I want to start this part of my presentation by discussing the origin of the terms sister girl and brother boy. There is a perception that being gay or transgender is a white man's disease. This is both considered within indigenous communities and in mainstream communities as well. It's perceived that queers do not exist in indigenous cultures, either now or prior to colonization. And while yes, historical accounts are rare, they do exist and so too does the evidence from the oral history, the oral tradition. We do know that there are words for trans people in some indigenous cultures, and forgive me, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce these words because um, I struggle with Chinese and I don't think I'm very good at pronouncing these Aboriginal languages. But these are a few examples of words that are used to refer to transgender people in some languages in the Northern Territory. In her interview with me, Crystal says that the term sister girl came out of the stolen generations. In the 1920s and 1930s, communities emerged out of the forced relocation. And in these quite artificial communities, indigenous women would protect gay and flamboyant trans people, to use Crystal's words. Crystal says that while they were stigmatised, there was certainly a place for them. Although there wasn't a word, they called them funny people. 
Crystal goes on to say that Sister Girl emerged from these interactions between women and the funny people. If a woman saw a feminine man, they say, hello, sister. And this is the emergence of the word Sister Girl. Kuncha Brown states that the term Sister Girl is a self-adopted term, recognising that Western definitions of transgender do not reflect the culture and lived reality of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander transgender people. And this is a, an important part because it's not often an easy translation to say that a sister girl or a brother boy is a transgender person. Often the definitions and certainly the specialities around culture, Indigenous culture, makes a difference. Although there has been very little information about sister girls, there's also less or there's even less about brother boys. In the documentary Brother Boys Yarning Up, published on YouTube, advocate, Brother Boy advocate Kai Clancy says that when he came out, he couldn't find anything about Brother Boys. There was nothing out there. There was only resources on Sister Girls, and that made me a bit worried about my transition. Kai and other Brother Boys have increased the profile of Brother Boys through public forums, documentaries, television appearances, and YouTube videos. Kai defines brother boy as an indigenous transgender or sex diverse person who was assigned female at birth, but inside they have a boy spirit and they live through the boy spirit. They take on male roles in society and community and they live lives as male. Being a brother boy encompasses your gender identity as well as your cultural identity. And we can see from this definition that this isn't just about gender or being transgender, it's also making a link towards cultural identity, spirit. And this is a key aspect of Sister Girls and Brother Boys stories, that it's more than just being transgender. It's also finding that Indigenous component to their identities as well. Earlier, I mentioned that trans Indigenous Australians have rarely been included in the Australian transgender literature. But this doesn't mean they haven't been articulating their concerns. as my inclusion of the first person narratives to this um, project indicates. At the first National Indigenous Sister Girl Forum in 1999, racism was clearly a central issue for those in attendance, and it remains so today. In his contribution to the anthology, Colouring the Rainbow, Brother Boy advocate Kai Clancy tells of an incident when a trans woman questioned his claim to be Aboriginal. He was shocked by this, stating, and this is in the trans community, Sian also questions whether sister girls are transgender. She said to me, the whole sister girl thing, it's not even transgender. They're just little gay boys dress up in the community. So for being rude, but it's really got nothing to do with transgender. Brianna is one of my participants, but she also made a contribution to the anthology Colouring the Rainbow. And she doesn't often experience discrimination or abuse from non-Indigenous people. Rather, the majority of it does come from Indigenous men, and that experience is pretty common with other sister girls as well. Many sister girls and brother boys are often rejected by family and community. Subsequently, they face the dilemma of choosing between being trans and being Aboriginal. This is perhaps one of the most common issues raised by sister girls and brother boys in the first-person narratives. Kai Clancy asked himself, would I lose my culture for the transition? Not unlike trans territorians more generally, sister girls and brother boys also face the dilemma of leaving not just the Northern Territory, but more specifically, leaving communities and country. This can have far more dire consequences for sister girls and brother boys because community and country are central aspects of their sense of self, as well as their health and well-being, especially their spiritual well-being. In a report published following the first National Indigenous Sister Girl Forum, Nanup notes that some sister girls have left their home country just so they may have some kind of life. But we all know that without family and country, we are sunk. As I come towards the end of today's presentation, I want to discuss Crystal, who is a prominent member of the sister girl community in the Tiwi Islands and has been an advocate for two decades. 
In 2012, she was elected to the Tiwi Isle Shire Council, and thus she is the first sister girl and trans woman to be elected to Australian public office. But it's through her story we get a glimpse of an example of what happens when sister girls and brother boys are confronted by a traditional culture. Most notably is a so-called custom referred to as payback, a custom of retribution against social transgressions. Payback was inflicted upon Crystal and members of her immediate family because she was a sister girl, and it consisted of verbal harassment, physical abuse, and rape. Although Crystal's father knew that she was a sister girl, she was forced to go through initiation. She says, my father thought that putting me through men's business would change me, but it didn't. Attempts to regulate her social transgression were not limited to her. Crystal's mother, brothers, sister, and grandparents were also held responsible for her being a sister girl. Although her mother was highly respected in the TV Island community, this did not stop her being bullied, spat and pissed on, and bashed. On Crystal's 18th birthday, her mother took her own life, and two of her brothers also took their own lives as a result of what was being done to them through payback. But Crystal doesn't describe these deaths as suicide. She says, all my family committed suicide, but it's not suicide. It's family guilt. In Crystal's work, she openly challenges this custom. Just because it is considered to be part of traditional culture doesn't mean it is okay. For Crystal and other sister girls and brother boys, their human rights override respect for this traditional culture. In her interview with me, she said, I see people suffer everywhere, right around the world. I'm suffering here in Australia, land of opportunity. Where was my human rights? Where was the gay movement for me? She went on to say that silence is not the way to go because people die from silence. Silence is a killer. As a result, she welcomes the opportunity to talk to people about her experiences. She says, these things have to be told and document. I document my life. Crystal has made a difference in the lives of younger sister girls and brother boys. She has won the respect in her community and she is revered as elder and auntie. However, suicide rate among sister girls and brother boys is still high. Unfortunately, there are no official statistics, but it is seen as one of the most common issues raised in the community, in the media. It is time, if not past time, that the wider Australian community started to really hear sister girls and brother boys. Several times today, I've mentioned that the Australian transgender literature has overlooked sister girls and brother boys. And this has not gone unnoticed by sister girls and brother boys. Joe Stott, who is another respected sister girl of the Tiwi Islands, has said, for 15 years now, we've been talking and talking. We still haven't been heard. I hope that my research can help in some way. Today, I've published some papers based on this research, and I'm happy to say that in September, my book will be published. And if anyone is interested in keeping updates on my research, I'm happy to take your email if you want to email me, and I'll put you on an email list where I'll send out notifications of updates, certainly in terms of the book and, um, and details about the book. I wanted to thank you all very much for coming along today. And thank you to Sally for organizing and um, being here, assuming she's gonna to return to us soon. And I'm open to um, any questions, if you wanna uh, ask me any questions in the chat option. Thank you. Hey, Sally. Lovely. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, yeah, so please, I'm just really interested in some uh, questions and reflections from any of the participants today. So there's just a little chat box on your lower left hand side. So please just type any reflections or questions you have there. Sometimes we understand that people are chat typing, so take yes. your time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> so
Sally, do you have any questions while people are thinking? Um, yeah, well, I, I certainly, I just want to say, I certainly really enjoyed your reflections and the, um, the, 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 the really your ability to explore those first person narratives beyond those you're able to directly source to interview directly for your um your research and i thought actually that the ability to go out to the public you know space and go well what actually what first person narratives are there already out there and how can i utilize them um so for me i thought it provided a really um uh, broad and diverse and quite insightful uh yeah uh, level level of, of information for your research and um much more than what we usually see by statistics i guess a lot of the research we see in our community is this this many percent of people experience this um and i think today it was really refreshing actually to hear some qualitative research that really delved into the narratives and the stories and i mm -hmm. personally really appreciated that mm -hmm. uh, so not a direct question but i just really want to say that actually uh, it really resonated Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. Um, I noticed that Lisa and Son have um, both um, asked questions, like great questions, but I'll address what Sally just said first. I think one of the things I realised when I first got to Darwin, like in 2012, and I started talking to people generally about what my research is, trans, and they said, oh, have you mentioned, have you ever met the Sister Girls? Have you heard of the Sister Girls? I'm going, Who are the Sister Girls? I've never heard. How come I, considering my area of expertise, has never heard of the Sister Girls? So I went and looked at the research going, why can I not find any mention of Sister Girls? Why is there no research in the established research about Sister Girls? And I realised maybe because of research doesn't necessarily capture um, Sister Girls. And when I started looking more broadly, I thought, well, actually, Sister Girls have been talking about their issues for a long time, Crystal, others, since the 1990s. There's lots of documents outside of the established academic field. So why isn't it being taken up? And I think this is really the first opportunity that I think the literature is taking a notice of research that's taking, or stuff that's taking place outside of the established research framework. And I, I was just surprised, well, why hasn't anyone done this before? It just really surprised me that that was the case. That here's this wealth of information, YouTube clips, interviews on television, um, articles in the newspaper, people talking about their experiences for since the 1990s. Yeah, it's never been taken up by the established re research. So, um, and I'm, I am proud to say that I'm one of the first academics to bring it into the field, um, but I'm just shocked that it's taken to the 2010s for this to actually take place. Um, but there's lots of material and sister girls and brother boys have been talking for some time about their issues. We just haven't been listening. Like um, Joe Stott said, you know, we've been talking, but nobody's listening and hopefully that will change now. Um, Okay, I want to just scroll back up to, um, sorry, where did that question go? There it is. So am I doing this right? Am I not finding up? Oh, sorry. Have you found it there, Stephen? So, uh, so we've got a, a question from, from Lisa O'Connor in the ACT. Uh, yep, got it. Sorry, yep. people I, I just had scrolled up. So I guess um, what Crystal has um, done is just being persistent. She's challenged the community. She's stepped forward and said, well, no, I'm not going to take this. So there's um, in her contribution to the anthology, I highly encourage people to get a copy of this anthology. It's a very good piece of work of queer Indigenous people across the country, but also includes Kai, Crystal and Brianna's stories as well. She talks about how she struggled in the community and she didn't give up. She did uh, um, originally leave the Northern Territory, but she came back because she re realised she, she was missing her culture and she couldn't make a change. So she's just struggled and she's earned that respect from a community by saying that, you know, we are Indigenous as well as transgender and really emphasising those stories. Um, she's a very tenacious woman and she's been working really hard and, and um, speaks out really, um, really well in public and often in public about what issues are going on. So her story is an amazing story and I'm really proud to be able to include her in my research. Um, so, so about the um, perception, I think a lot of um, trans indigenous people who I have spoken to have said that what happens is if they get forced out of their community, they, they, they have this perception that when they go to the gay community or the trans community, they'll be accepted as trans. But what often they experience is that inherent racism in Australia, and this is often one of those delicate subjects, but I 
I do believe Australia is inherently racist. And I think that the trans community and the queer community generally is very racist and very exclusionist, certainly in terms of Indigenous people. So they find that exclusion. But it's not just attitudes, it's also language, because for a lot of Indigenous people who are coming from regional areas, English is maybe the third or fourth language. So they don't have that capacity to actually engage on that level. And so that's uh, going to be um, uh, prohibiting engagement. And certainly um, I think a lot of the queer community struggles with those sort of um, barriers generally, but more so I think with Indigenous people because of those inherent racist values. I don't think people, don't think people are racist, but I think people have racist views that have come from a generation and from a history of um, ignore, ignorance. Okay, so we've got that another one. Okay, um, Shelley, excellent question, because lots have actually changed in the last six months. So officially my research is finished, but lots of stuff is still going on. Um, so the local Headspace organization has set up a, a youth group for um, queer and gender diverse people. Um, lots of organizations are now talking about sister girls as part of the suicide. So the local organization called Rainbow Territory, the Department of Health, and nationally with the, the Alliance, um, sorry, the National LGBTI Health Alliance, I think I've got it covered, um, yes. are, are, are all now in, aware of these issues, certainly in terms of suicide. So there's lots of suicide prevention strategies now rolling out who are, um, and through my research, making sure everyone knows about what's going on and including these important issues around sister girls and brother boys. So it's a lot of things have changed and there's a lot more um, going on. Um, and so this is a really good um, time, I think, for things have changed. So a lot of the participants I've interviewed, I did so two years ago when there was nothing. Um, one of my participants who I research, interviewed this year, she was able to go to this new support group. So even just two years, so much has changed. We're not there yet. We're nowhere near finished, but it's certainly um, things have changed. The Northern Territory does have a doctor. Sorry, Darwin does have a doctor who flies in, literally flies in and presents uh, a clinic for um, queer and gender diverse people in the Darwin. Um, and there is currently a fundraiser ha taking place in a month's time, I think. Sorry, next month to provide them with more support, financial support. So there's a lot of things taking place, but it's really, um, you know, we're still in the grassroots area. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. That's, I guess, what I want to say. Things have changed and improved a lot. Did I get, get all my questions? <laughs> uh, I think is there one more down the bottom about uh, where of uh, oh, yeah, non-binary uh, non or gender queer identifying people in Aboriginal communities? So when, um, so the term sister girl is more of an umbrella term for a range of diversities. So like the term transgender is often used as an umbrella term. So this is also inclusive of people who are traditional trans, people who go through sex reassignment surgery or now live from, go from one gender identity to the other gender identity. But there's also that diversity. So people are using sister girl as a more pluralized term. So it's not just traditional trans. And that's why that quote from Contra Brown is important because I, we don't want people thinking of trans, um, sister girls and brother boys as just transgender. There's a diversity within that. So um, gender queer people, um, queer identifying, non-binary is very much a, an inherent part of sister girls. And I think that comes back to a little bit of what Cianne had mentioned about, well, sister girls aren't really trans. And in a way, she's correct in that because sister girls is quite diverse. So it's not traditional trans. Um, but it is also trans as well. So it's that diversity, I guess, that's there. Um, and I think that's sometimes difficult when we think of different cultures. Um, the origin of Sisigal, which I didn't go into today, um, so in some areas of the Northern Territory, Sisigal also has a connotation of just being gay, so gay community, so gay men are also part of the Sisigal communities. Um and that was very much in the 1990s, but more recently, the term sister girl, very much associated with trans, but it does have that history. And again, it's one of those reasons why it's not a good idea to translate sister girl as being solely trans, because it's a bit more complicated than that. 
as gender identity just is. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, for me, I've actually found this to be a really, really informative and quite a refreshing actually webinar that has moved away from, from statistics and, and putting people into boxes into really exploring um, the, the, the complex lives of people within our community. Um, mm. and, and as you reflected, um, certainly the National LGBTI Health Alliance uh, are doing a lot more work engaging with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, LGBTI communities. Um, and, and facilitating uh, access to the voices, as you said, the people who are mm. in these communities who mm. uh, live th their lives and are sharing their stories and are working really hard to uh, make differences in their local communities. Um, but it's often not seen, and certainly on a national level, it's certainly not seen, but often at, at local levels, there will be um, people there doing amazing amazing work mm. and so we've, mm. we've um, really started to really actively engage with um, these people in these communities to help them inform our work and for us to support them in their work mm. as well. Um, so I, I tend to think when, when it comes to, I think statistics have their place but mm. I mean they make me cry and fall asleep um, so I've never been a fan um, but I think yeah it's that richness and um, that hearing a voice you instantly think of yourself and the compassion and that's i think that's the key to finding change um and that's why i've always you know prefer those sort of stories um because you hear that in yourself and there's something human about that um but i think that emphasis is essential for indigenous culture because that's such a part of their traditional culture um so that's the key i think to unraveling the the certainly the differences between Indigenous and non-Indigenous cultures and research in particular is that has to be focused solely on these sort of qualitative uh, methods um, and not and not have to justify that all the time, if that makes sense. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, um, Stephen, you, for, you, for coming today. Uh, Stephen's pleasure. email is just up on screen there. So for people who are interested in staying in contact with Stephen and to receive a copy of, email of their book, yeah, please email and get on get on their mailing list. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing this come out and, and I imagine it's going to be a really useful resource to, to our work in our community. Um, today's webinar has been recorded as well. Uh, so it will be made available on the uh, Knowledge Hub uh, on the National LGBTI Health Alliance website in the next coming days. Um, so please feel free to share this through your networks and um, to, to further some conversations in our community. Um, so thank you very much and we'll see you back here next month um, for our next webinar. So thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone.